Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to my channel. And for those of you who are new, welcome to my channel. My name is Rebecca Gardner, and welcome back to another episode of my Read Along With Me series. Um, for today's episode, I'm going to be reading four chapters, and last episode I read two chapters. So basically what happened in the last two chapters is that Melinda talks about how frustrated her Spanish teacher is with the students because they pretend that they don't understand the assignments and but also she, they don't understand what she's saying and it's kind of frustrating for her and then she talks about and then Melinda talks about job day so yeah, that's what we read last time. But so today we're going to be reading um the part where Melinda goes to her social studies class and Mr. Neck kind of t talks about um his family and um he talks about why his son wouldn't get wouldn't get a job and David's stood up and well I'm not going to give anything away but um yeah basically Mr. Neck talks to his talks about his family and he kind of starts the debate and then um Thanksgiving comes and her mom forgot to thaw the turkey and so on and so on. We'll go into more depth of it. So, um, yeah, let's get reading. Mr. Neck storms into class, a bull chasing 33 red flags. flags. <clears throat> we slide into our desk. I think for sure he's going to explode. Which he does, but in an unpredictable, faintly educational way. Immigration, he writes on the board. I'm pretty sure he spelled it right. My, f my family has been living in this country for over 200 years. We built this place. Fought in every war from the first one to the last one. Paid taxes and voted. A cartoon thought bubble forms over the heads of everyone in the class. Will this be on the test? So tell me why my... <clears throat> Sorry. So tell me why my son can't get, a, can't get a job. A few hands creep skyward. Mr. Neck ignores them. Ignores it, them. It is a pretend question. One he asked so he could give the answer. I relax. This is like when my this is like when my father complains about his boss. The best thing to do is to stay awake and blink sympathetically. His son wanted to be a firefighter, but didn't get the job. Mr. Neck is convinced that this is some kind of reverse discrimination. He says we should close our borders so that the, so that real Americans get the jobs they deserve. The job test said that I would be a good firefighter. I wonder if I could take a job away from Mr. Neck's son. I tune out and focus on my doodle, a pine tree. I've been trying to carve a linoleum block in, block in art class. The problem with the block is that there is no way to correct mistakes. Every mistake I make is frozen in the picture, so I have to think ahead. Mr. Neck writes on the board again. Debate. America should have closed her borders in 1900. That strikes a nerve. Several nerves. I can see kids counting back, counting backward on counting counting backward on their fingers trying to figure when their parents or grandparents were born. When they came to America, 
if they would have made a neck cut. They figure out they would have been stuck in a country that hated hated them, or a place with no schools, or a place with no future. Their hands shoot up. They beg to defer with Mr. Nick's learned opinion. I don't know where my family came from. Some some place cold cold. Where they were they beans on Thursday and hang their wash on line on on the line on Monday. I don't know how long we've been in America. We've been in this schools we've been in this schools school district since I was in first grade. That that must count for something. I start an apple tree. The arguments jump back and forth across the room. A few suck ups quickly figure out which, which side Mr. Mr. Neck is squat squatting on, so they fight to throw the foreigners. Anyone whose family Im immigrated in the last century has a story to tell how about how hard relatives work, the contributions they make to the country, the taxes they pay. A member of the archery club tries to say that we are all foreigners and we should give the country back to the Native, Native Americans, but she buried under disagreement. Mr. Neck enjoys the noise until one kid challenges him directly. Maybe your son didn't get that job because he's not good enough, or he's lazy, or the other guy was better than him, no matter what his skin color. I think the white people who have been here for 200 years are the ones pulling down the country. They don't know how to work. They've made it too easy. The pro-immigration forces erupt in applause and hooting. You watch your mouth. You watch your... <laughs> You watch your mouth, mister. You are talking about my son. I don't want to hear f any more from you. That's enough debate. Get your books out. The neck is back in control. Showtime is over. I tried to draw a branch coming out of a tree trunk for the 315th time. It looks flat. A cheap, cruddy drawing. I have no idea how to make it come alive. I am so confused. I did not I don't notice at first that David Petrakis, my lab partner, had stu has stood up. The class drops, to stops talking. I put my pencil down. Mr. Petrakis, take your seat. David Petrakis is never, ever in trouble. He is the kid who wins perfect attendance records. Who helps the staff chase down bugs in the computer files to report of report cards? I chew, I chew a hangnail on my pinky. What is he thinking? Was he flipped? Finally cracked on under the. Was he flipped? Finally cracked under the pressure of being smarter than everyone. If the class is debating, then each student has the right to say what's on his mind. I decide who talks in here. You started a debate. You can't just, you can't close it just because it's not going, because it's, it is not going your way. Watch me. Take, take your seat, Mr. Mr. Petrakis. The Constitution does not recognize different classes of citizenship based on time spent living in the country. I am a citizen with the same rights as your son or you. As a citizen and as a student, I am I am protesting the tone of this lesson as racist, intolerant, and xenophobic. Sit your back, sit your butt in that chair, Petrakis, and watch your mouth. I tried to get I tried to get a debate going in here, and you people turn it into a race thing. Sit down, or you're going to the principal. David stares at Nick, at Mister Nick. Looks at the flag for a second, for a minute, then picks up his books and walks out of the classroom. He says a million things without saying a word. I make a note to study Mr. N to study David Petrakis. I have never heard a more eloquent silent. The 
pilgrims gave gave thanks at Thanksgiving because the Native Americans saved their sorry butts for starving from starving. I give thanks at Thanksgiving because my fi- my mother finally goes to work and my father orders pizza. My normally harried rush mo- rushed mother always turns to into a shrug out retail junkie just before Turkey Day. Because it's because of Black Friday, the the day after Thanksgiving, the start of Christmas sh- shopping season. <laughs> If she doesn't sell a bil- billion shirts and twelve million m- belts on Black Friday, the world will the world will end. She lives on cigarettes and black coffee, swearing like a rap a rap star and calculating spreadsheets on her in her head. The goals she sets for her store are totally unrealistic, and she knows it. She can't help herself. It's like watching someone caught in an electronic electronic fence, twitching and squirming and very stuck. Every year, just when she's she's stressed to the snapping point, she cooks Thanksgiving dinner. We beg her not to. We plead with her. Send anonymous anon, anonymous notes. She wouldn't. She doesn't listen. I go to bed the night before Thanksgiving at 10 p.m. She is pounding on her laptop at the dining room, ta- dining room table. When I come downstairs Thanksgiving morning, she is still there. I don't think she slept. She looks up at me in my robe and my bunny slipper- slippers. Oh, shoot. She says, the turkey. I peel potatoes while she gives the frozen turkey a hot bath. The windows fog up, separating us from the outside. I want, I want to suggest that we have something else for dinner, spaghetti, spaghetti maybe or or sandwiches. But I know she wouldn't take it the right way. She hacks at the guts of the turkey with an ice pick to, to get out the bag of body pot parts. I'm impressed. Last year she took she cooked a bird with the bag inside. Cooking Thanksgiving dinner means something to her. It's like a holy obligation, part of what makes her a wife and a mother. My family doesn't talk talk much and we have nothing in common, but my mother cooks a proper Thanksgiving dinner. It says we'll be a family for more than for more for one more year Kodak logic only in film commercials does stuff like that work I finished the potatoes she sends me to the TV to watch the parade dad stumbles downstairs how is she he asks before he goes in the kitchen it's Thanksgiving I say he puts on his coat. Donuts? He asks. I nod. The phone rings. The phone rings. Mom answers. It's the store. Emergency number one. I go into the kitchen for a soda. She pours me an orange. She pours me orange juice, which I can't drink because it burns my scabby lips. Lips. The turkey floats in the sink. A ten-pound turkey iceberg. A turkey iceberg. I feel pre- I feel very much like the Titan the Titanic. Mom hangs up and chases me out of out with instructions to take a shower and clean my room. I soak in I soak in the bathtub. I fill my lungs with air and float on top of the water. Then flo- blow out all my breath and sink in the bottom sink to the bottom. I put my head underwater to to listen to my heartbeat. The phone rings again. Emergency number two. By the time I'm dressed, the parades are over, and Dad is watching football. Confectioners sugar sugar dust the stumble on his face. I don't like it when he bums around the house in ho- on holidays. I like my dad clean-shaven and wearing a suit. 
he he motions for me to get out of the way so he can see the screen. Mom is on the phone. Emergency number three. The, lo the long curly cord snakes around, around and around and around her thin body, like a rope tying her to us to the stake. Two drumstick tips poke out of poke out of an anonymous pot of of boiling water. She is boiling the turkey, the frozen tur turkey. It's too big for the microwave, she explains. It will be thawed soon. She puts a finger in her free air ear to concentrate on what the phone is telling her. I take a plain donut from the bag and go back to my room. Three magazines later, my parents are arguing. Not a rip roar. A simmering argument. A few bubbles fly splashing in on the stove i want another donut but don't feel like waiting through the fight to get it they retreat to their corners and the phone rings again here's my chance mom has the phone to her ear when i walk in the kitchen but she's she isn't listening to it she rubs the stream from the window and stares and stares into the backyard I join her at the sink. Dad strides across the backyard, wearing an oven mitt and carrying the steaming turkey by one leg. <clears throat> he said it would take hours to thaw, but he said it would take hours to thaw, mutters mom. A tiny voice squeaks from the receiver. No, not you, Ted. She tells the phone. Dad lays the turkey on the on the chopping chopping block and picks up his hatchet. Whack. The hatchet sticks to the frozen turkey flesh. He saw he saws back and forth. Whack. A slice of frozen turkey slides into slides to the ground. He picks it up and waves it at the window. Mom turns her back to him and tells Ted she is on her way. After Mom leaves for the store, Dad takes over the dinner. It's the principle of the of the thing. If he gripes out about the way the way he handled she handled Thanksgiving, then he has to prove what prove he can do a better job. He brings in the Butcher dirty meat and washes it in the sink with detergent and hot water. He rinses off his hatchet. Just like the old days, right, Melly? Fellow, fellow goes out into the woods and brings home, brings home dinner. This isn't so difficult. Cooking re just requires some organization and the ability to read. Now give me the bread. I'm going to make real stuffing in the way my mother used to. You don't need to help. Why don't you do do some homework, maybe some extra credit extra credit work to pull those grades up. I'll call you when dinner is ready. I think about studying, but it's a holiday, so I park myself on the living room couch and watch an old t an old movie instead. I smell smoke twice. Once when once when glass shatters on the floor and listen on listen on the other phone to his conversation with the turkey hotline lady she says turkey soup is the best part of thanksgiving anyway he calls me into the kitchen an hour later with the fake enthusiasm of a father who has screwed up big time bone bones are heaped on on cut on the cutting board, a pot of glue foils on the stove, bits of gray, green, and yellow roll on the burping white white paste. <clears throat> it's supposed to be soup. It's supposed. It tasted a bit watery, so I kept adding thickener. 
I put in some corn and peas. Call for pizza. I'll get rid of this. I order double cheese, double mushroom. Dad buries the soup back in the backyard next to our dead big dead beagle Ariel. I wanted to make a memorial for our turkey. Never has a bird been so tortured to provide such a lousy dinner. I dig the bones out of the trash and bring them to art class. Mr. Freeman was thrilled. Mr. Freeman is thrilled. He tells me to work on the bird but keep thinking tree. You are on fire, Melinda. I can I can see it in your eyes. You are caught up in the meaning in the subjectivity of the effect of commercialism on, on this holiday. This is wonderful. Wonderful. Be the bird. You are the bird. Sacrifice yourself to abandon family to abandon va family values and canned yams. Whatever. At first I wanted I want to glue the bones together in a heap like firewood. Get it, tree, firewood? But Mr. Freeman sighs. I can do better, he says. I, I arrange the bones on a black piece of paper and try to draw a turkey around it. I don't need Mr. Freeman to tell me it stinks. By this point, he has thrown himself back into his own painting and has forgotten we exist. He is working on a huge canvas. It started out bleak, a gutted building along the gray road on a rainy day. He spent a week painting every painting dirty coins on the sidewalk, sweating to get them right. He painted the face of the school board members peering out the windows of the building. Then he puts bars on the windows and turns the and turned the building into a prison. His canvas is better than TV because you never know what is going to happen next. I crumble the paper and lay out the bones on the on the table. Melinda Sardino, anthro and anthropologist. I have unearthed the remains of the of a hideous sacrifice. The bell rings, and I look at Mr. Freeman with puppy dog eyes. He says he'll call my Spanish teacher with some kind of excuse. I can stay for another class, period. When Ivy hears this, she begs permission to stay late, too. She is trying to conquer her fear of clowns. She is constructing some weird sculpture, a mask behind a clown's face. Mr. Freeman says I yes to Ivy, too. She waggles her eyebrows and at me and grins. By the time I figure out at this that this might be a good time to say something friendly to her, she is back at work. I glue the bones to a block of wood, arranging the skeleton like a museum exhibit. I find knives and forks in a, in the odds and ends bin and glue them so it looks like they are attacking the bones. I take a step back. It isn't quite done. I rummage to the bin again and find a half-melted palm tree from a Lego set. It'll do. Mr. Freeman hangs on to every everything a normal, normal person would throw out. Happy Meal toys, lost playing cards, grocery store receipts, receipts, receipts. <laughs> Uh, keys, dolls, a, a salt shaker, trains. How does he know this stuff could be art? I pop the head off a, off a Barbie doll and set it inside the turkey's body. That feels right. Ivy walks past and looks. She arches her, le her left eyebrow and nods. I wave my, my hand to hand and Mr. Freeman comes over to inspect. He almost faints with delight. Excellent. Excellent. 
What does what does this say to you? Darn, I don't know. There I don't know there would be a quiz. I clear my throat. I can't get any words out. It's too it is too dry. I try again with a little cough. Sore throat? Don't worry, it's coming around. Want me to tell you what I see? I nod in relief. I see a girl caught in the remains of a holiday gone bad, with her flesh picked off every picked off day after day as the carcass dries out. The knife and the fork are obviously middle class sen sen sensibilities. The palm tree is a nice touch. A broken dream, perhaps. Plastic honeymoon. Deserted island. Island. Oh, if you put it in a in a slice of pumpkin pie, it would be a de deserted island. I laugh in spite of myself. I'm getting the hang of the hang of this. Of this. While Ivy and Mr. Freeman watch, I reach and pluck out the Barbie Barbie head. I set it on top of top of the bony carcass. There is no place for the palm tree. I toss that aside. I move the knife and fork so they look like legs. I place a piece of tape over Barbie's mouth. Do you have any do you have any twigs? Little branches? I could use them to make the arms. Ivy opens her mouth to say something, then closes it again. Mr Freeman studies my homely project. He doesn't say anything and I'm afraid he's pissed that I looked at took out the palm tree. Ivy tries again. It's scary, she says. In a weird way, not clown scary. Um, how do I see this? Like, you don't want to, you don't want to look at it too long. Good job, Mel. That is not the reaction I was hoping for, but I guess it was positive. She could have turned her nose up or ignored me, but she didn't. Mr. Freeman taps his chin. He looks way too serious to be an art to an art to be an art teacher. He's making me nervous. This has meaning. Pain. The bell rings. I leave before he can say more. We are studying fruit in biology. Miss Kane has has spent a week teaching us of the finer points of stamens and pistils and pistils. Seed, seed pods and flowers. The earth, the earth has frozen. It snows lightly at, at night, but Miss Kane is determined to keep springy, spring alive in her, in her classroom. The back row sleeps until she points out the, that apple trees need bees to produce, reproduce. Reproduce is a trigger word for the back row. They've, they have figured it out since it was, since it is related to sex. The lecture on pistols and stamens turn, turns into a big ha-ha. Miss Keene has been teaching since the Middle Ages. It would make more than, more than a row full of overheated hypothalamus. Hypo, Hypothalamuses to to distract her from the from the day's lesson. She calmly proceeds to the hands-on portion of the lab. Apples. We each get a Rome or a Cortland or a Macintosh and a plastic knife. We are instructed to dissect. The back row holds sword, fight. sword fights. Miss Kane silence, silently writes their names on blackboard, along with their current grade. She takes one point off for every minute the sword fight continues. They go from low Bs to very low Cs before they figure out what's going on. They howl. That's not fair! You can't do that to us! You... Didn't give us a chance. 
She takes off another point. They saw her, their, they saw their apples mutter, 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 curse, curse, old cow, stupid teacher. Dave Petrak is my lab partner, cuts his apple into eight equal wedges. He doesn't say a word. He is in the middle of a pre-med week. David can't make up his mind between pre-med and pre-law. Ninth grade is a minor inconvenience to him. A zit cream commercial before the future film, feature film of life. Apple smell smoke soaks in the air. One time I was little, I, my parents took me to the orchard. Dad let me set me high in that in an apple tree. It was like falling up to a storybook. Yummy and red and leaf and the and the branch of shaking branch shaking not shaking a bit. Bees bumbled through the air, so stuffed with apple they couldn't be bothered to sting me. The sun warmed my hair, and the wind pushed my mother and the wind pushed my mother into my father's arms. And all the apple picking parents and children la- smiled for a long, long minute. That's how biology smells. I bite my apple. White teeth, red apple, hard juice, deep bite. David sputters. You're not supposed to do that. She'll kill you. You're n- you're supposed to cut it. Don't you? Didn't you even listen? You'll lose points. Clearly, David missed the. Apple tree sitting requir- requirement of childhood. I cut the rest of my apple into four fat pieces. My apple has twelve seeds. One of the seeds has split has split eh, split its shell and reaches a white hand upward. An apple an apple tree growing from an apple seed growing in growing in an apple. I show a little plant seed to Miss Keene. She gives me extra credit. David rolls her eyes. Biology is cool. So, yeah, basically, um, uh, Mr. Melinda goes to her social studies class, and Mr. Nick talks about his family, and they were talking about immigration, and Mr. Nick gets the debate going, and then it's, and then the discussion is just not going his way, so he ended the discussion, and then David, David Petrakis stood up, and, and like, spoke his mind when like when I read when I read this book and when I watched the movie I was like yes David Petrakis speak up to the teacher (laughs) but like seriously I love David like he is one of the best characters in the book but yeah and and then uh it goes to And then it gets to Thanksgiving time when her mom was prepping, prepping for Thanksgiving dinner, but then she forgot about the turkey and, um, and her dad decided to, um, switch it up a bit because it's not going their way. And then Melinda finds this wishbone and these wishbones and took it to her class and then she created something that is meaningful something that said something to her art teacher like that is so cool um I want to ask you guys a discussion question and that is What is the time when, um, when you created something that 
that says something to people. Like, when, what is the time, when is the time when you created a piece of art that says something to, to people? And it's not just, like, visual arts stuff. It would, it could be, like, a poem or a song or a story or something like that. But, like, what, what is a time when you created something created something that says something to people let me know in the comments below and let's get the discussion going guys that's why i created this series so that i can interact with you guys and that we can talk about this book because yeah <laughs> um anyways i hope you guys enjoyed this video and i hope you guys enjoyed the series click on subscribe to my channel and click on the notification bell so that um, you would know when new episodes are coming. Um, new episodes will be coming every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. And don't worry, I will still be doing covers on YouTube, but this is my way of interacting with you guys and, and incorporating reading into my life because I love to read, and especially with this, uh, this book. Okay, I'm gonna end this video. Um, remember to stay happy, stay safe, and stay cool. And I am off to the moon, and I will be back soon.